Hello and welcome to season four, episode nine of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. We have over 130 episodes recorded and available on YouTube. So if you miss out because of load shedding or your Tuesday nights have become busy, never fear, you can always catch up later. Now, there's only one week to go before Flock to the Wilderness, when we will be descending on the garden route to take advantage of the incredible birds, which call this beautiful place home. Tonight, David Allen will be sharing his insights into the birds of the Neisner estuary as part of the build-up to this, the exciting Flock event. David Allen is no stranger to conservation conversations, having presented previously on Birding the Roof of Africa, the Pelagics out of KZN, and Ounce of the Birds in Durban Harbour. So if you happen to miss any of those, please go to our YouTube channel to, to watch them. David is probably one of our most regular contributors and without doubt one of South Africa's top ornithologists, having been, been recognized as the Gill Memorial Medal recipient at BirdLife South Africa's previous ABM. Despite retiring from the Durban Museum in 2021, David has remained busy and tonight will share some more of his lifelong passion for observing water birds as he takes us through the incredible nice estuaries, estuary and the bird, birds that call it home. It is, of course, a well-timed talk given the start of Flock to the Wilderness next week. David, it's always a pleasure to have you on and uh, it's over to you now. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much for that. Um, hopefully you're hearing me now and the video will be coming up. Yes. Yeah, so yes. should we go to share screen? Yes, please do. There we go, I can see it. Okay. Just make it full screen, so hopefully it comes up. How's that? Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you very much to yourself and to BirdLife South Africa for inviting me to give another talk. And uh, yes, hello to everybody out there. And thank you for tuning in to listen to this um, uh, talk about the water birds of, of Neisner Estuary. Um, it was uh, uh, a couple, quite a while back now, I was approached by Alan Whitfield. Um, who lives down in the Neisner Estuary area, um, and he asked me if I would help um, contribute to a book they were putting together on the estuary, <clears throat> and specifically to tackle a chapter on the water birds, with numerous other people contributing to chapters on um, other aspects of the ecology of the estuary. Um, the book itself is now virtually complete and will be published apparently in a in a, um, a month or so, um, with uh, Alan being one of the editors, along with Professor Charles Breen and Mark Reed, who will be very well known to people from BirdLife South Africa. Christine and Mark Reed have been very involved for many years with BirdLife, and actually they allowed me to um, stay in their house. My wife and I went down to Neisner to get some first-hand experience of the estuary as part of this effort, and they let us uh, stay in their house down there for a week, which was wonderful. Um, the chapter, you, what, what I realized fairly quickly, you know, I was, I, I'm, I'm up here in Durban, I'm quite distant from Neisner Estuary, and although I was very keen to take Alan up on his offer, what I didn't realize was that there are, of course, other people that have worked quite extensively and are still working extensively on the water birds of the estuary, and it was um, only when I was down there, really, and fully committed to the project that I realized that there were other people who would have to be involved in getting all the information together on the water birds of the estuary. Um, in particular, um, Ian Russell, who works for National Parks Board, ornithologist with them, based in the Wilderness Lakes area, who has been doing a lot of collection, um, working with analyzing data from the water bird counts from the estuary. And uh, Lorna Watt and Pat Nurse, both of whom I think who are, are logged in tonight listening to the talk. They're both residents of Neisner, and they're the real stalwarts of the um, biannual quack counts that I'll mention a little bit later. Um, and also Dr. Jane Turpey, 
a colleague of mine from the University, from University of Cape Town, still lives in Cape Town. She's also done quite a bit of Nisner estuary. So essentially, the chapter and the talk I'm giving to you tonight is a combination of the efforts of all of these people. And so that's why you see their names reflected there in the, in the chapter. And of course, as Christina said, it's uh, this date was chosen by Melissa Whitecross for this talk because it was a bit of a lead into Flock to Wilderness, which will be occurring from 24th to 28th of May. Um, and so perhaps hopefully this talk helps set the scene for the people that are going down to the BirdLife AGM and LAB conference. And maybe some of you will actually be able to get late bookings to go down if you hadn't done so already. Okay, here's a photograph of Nisner Estuary. And while we were down there, my wife and I, for that week, we were able to get some of the photographs that I've used in this talk. Um, and this is one of the shots at dusk over a, a major central expanse of Nisner Estuary. At 1,366 hectares, it's the largest estuary between Cape Point um, and, the eastern, and the Eastern Cape area, essentially the warm temperate biogeographical zone, they call it. It's in the top 10 of estuaries in the country in terms of its size. And it's the most important South African estuary in terms of, or in terms of its overall conservation value, taking estuary size, type, rarity, and biodiversity, i.e. the plants, invertebrates, fish, and birds into account. So it's a really important site. Um, a lot of people will know it as Nisner Lagoon, but technically, a lagoon is, is not what, what Neisner is. Neisner is more an estuary. A lagoon is a sort of embayment um, in a coastal system um, where essentially uh, salt marine water is embayed without really a gradient in, in, in salinity and without a major river feeding into um, lagoons. Whereas an estuary, which is where it usually has a river coming in at the top, and then a long linear structure to it with increasing salinity as you get closer to the coast. So that's why technically it's it's really falls in the category of an estuary rather than a lagoon. You know, a nice example of more a lagoon situation is Langabarn Lagoon, where there's no major river feeding into that. Um, it's just a tidal system and very much marine dominated. Um, I've designed my talk tonight rather poorly because it's cut out the top uh, writing that I have on the slide, which means I can't really see what I had there. But essentially, early assessments, um, that's working from memory, on the, uh, let me see if I can get rid of this possibly. No, I won't be able to do that. Anyway, no problem. Er early assessments of um, the estuary showed that it was, um, very important for water birds, particularly for migratory waders, um, and was one of the most important sites for migratory waders on that southern Cape coastal area. I think I've just slowed down the, the process of the talk here. Let me just give it a moment to catch up with me. It's ranked 13 out of the 258 estuaries in South Africa in terms of its importance for aquatic AV fauna. However, um, its water bird numbers are generally considered lower than are expected given the size and extent of apparently suitable habitat, which means that although the numbers of water birds is high, their density is typically lower than at many other permanently open estuaries. There's been argument about what are the major causes for this fairly low density of water birds at Nisner Estuary. And one of the suggestions has been that human disturbance is involved. The estuary, of course, is situated right on the edge of a fairly major town the tentacles of which extend along much of the shoreline. 
Um, and so there's um, also huge influxes of holiday makers at particular times of the year, in addition to all the other human disturbance factors that you get at Neisner Estuary. This photograph shows a, a couple out there taking their dogs for a walk. It's a pretty innocuous looking site, but of course, even that low level of activity of those people and their dogs moving along the edge of the estuary can provide a disturbance factor for birds. And when you multiply that by hundreds or thousands of people, you end, in a, you end up with a situation where human disturbance can start to have a population level effect on water birds. And this is a challenge in a system like uh, Neisner Estuary. Um, it is a national park, so it has a great deal of protection, but it also is very extensively used by people and provides really a, a challenging test case for how you can allow these heavy pressures of people to coexist with a, a protected national a protected um, national wetland like this. Um, it's also pretty unusual, in fact, fairly unique in the South African setting in having two intensively settled islands situated right within the middle of the estuary itself. Those are Thiessen Island and Leisure Isle, which both have fairly um, expansive upmarket housing estates situated on them, which brings in, of course, uh, alterations to habitat and, of course, direct human disturbance. Um, it, it's also been suggested that um, the there is a relatively that, that perhaps there's a relatively low biomass of invertebrate burrowing invertebrates in the tidal flats at Neisner Estuary that um, that is responsible for lower densities than might be expected. However, the studies by invertebrate biologists on the on that aquatic invertebrate um, fauna in the estuary shows that it's rich and abundant. And it may therefore be that perhaps some element of accessibility to feeding water birds that feed on invertebrates um, is involved. So it's not the actual amount of invertebrates, their availability may be the problem. And, and a negative impact on availability can come from these tidal mudflats, as you can see in this photograph here, being covered by sea lettuce and eelgrass, which are um, intertidal plants that grow quite prolifically on these tidal flats and can therefore interfere with feeding in these areas by invertebrate feeders as they simply can't get into the mud to get to their food resources. And this can be, seems to be exacerbated in some areas, particularly close to the Thiessen Island area, um, where there is sewage outflow from the nearby town of Neisner, which provides an enrichment of the estuary in those areas, um, a eutrophication, which results in an even more prolific growth, particularly of the sea lettuce, as you see in this photograph here. Now, of course, the Egyptian goose is quite happy with that because it's a plant feeder rather than an invertebrate feeder. So it's quite happy to tuck into that vegetation matter there. And also another reason for perhaps the low nutrient sta uh, status of the estuary is that there's a, a great tidal interchange between this massive estuary and the marine environment offshore through the heads, which is a wide, deep channel connecting the estuary with the open ocean. Normally estuaries have a more sandy and frequently more shallow and more easily closed um, outflow that frequently can be closed entirely at times and restrict the movement of marine water in and out of the estuary. But that's not the case at, at Neisner Lagoon. There is a massive interchange and I think the figures are such that there's a greater interchange of water in and out of Neisner Estuary on each tidal cycle than on all of the other South African estuaries combined. And certainly when Debbie and I, my wife and I were down there, we took a small, small canoe out as you'll see in a minute and were soon made very much aware of the strength of these massive tidal flows 
coming into and out of the estuary. But that's bringing in fairly nutrient poor marine waters into the estuary and flushing out more nutrient rich waters coming in from the upper parts of the estuary. And of course, in the Feinbos biome, the soils themselves are, are fairly nutrient poor. So you're perhaps not getting particularly strong nutrient inflows into the estuary. But one other effect of, of all of this is that the water in the estuary is particularly clean and clear as a result of, of this tidal action and the nature of the, the water resource in the estuary. And that, of course, is a great benefit to piscivorous species. Your fish eating birds relying on visual hunting of fish, the clearer the water is, the more efficiently they'll be able to hunt um, their prey. But anyway, to sum up, the estuary, by virtue of its sheer size, supports the greatest number of water birds of all the estuarine systems in that warm, temperate biogeographical zone characteristic of the Southern Cape Coast. Okay, now our information on water bird numbers comes from, from the various water bird counts. Um, Nice estuary, the very earliest accounts go back to about the mid 1900s. But compared with several other large estuaries in South Africa, the AV fauna of Nice estuary has been relatively poorly studied. Um, early, an early account includes counts estimates of many water bird species done during March, August 1944. And that that paper was published in a, the scientific journal Ostrich, the Journal of BirdLife South Africa, the SAOS in those days. It's quite a lengthy article and it's quite charming. It's a uh, very wordy, but it's from a Central African administrator who was obviously on his long leave, came down and stayed in Neisner between March and August. And he kicks off his account of the water birds of the area and the other birds. It was a, a general account of all the the AV fauna around Neisner, as saying that he wanted to use the opportunity to take up the hobby of bird watching. And as a result of that stay, which was fairly lengthy, he wrote it up in a very detailed account in Ostrich. Um, and reading through those results is very interesting and resonates with a lot of what we find in the results today and what I found when I was down there on my visit. Um, and I was, it was an example of those old, fashioned natural history type accounts um, that have been so illuminating and teaching us and providing the foundation of much of what we know about our, our birds these days. So if any of you want to dig it up, go, go back to Ostrich and, and dig around for this early account of the water birds of Neisner estuary. But the first really comprehensive count was only made as relatively recently as January 1979. Um, when the erstwhile Western Cape Wader study group visited the estuary and did a comprehensive count of the whole estuary. But the real information that populates most of the results of this book chapter and of this talk come from the Quack Counts, the Coordinated Water Birds Project Count. Um, these are conducted nationwide at low tide biannually in summer, typically one count in January, and then again in winter in July. And that photograph there shows me sitting in the middle there amongst a, a bunch of ladies who all come out every six months, organized by Pat Nurse and Lorna Watt. Um, this is Lorna's photograph, and I think she's the one who's waving there and looking away from the camera. Um, and they go out, this is a National Parks Board boat, and they go around a major part of the estuary counting the water birds from the boat. Very similar to what we do here in Durban Bay on a monthly basis, actually, which I've talked about before. And then there are other teams, another team that works on a boat. I think um, it's actually a Pat nurse who goes out on another boat. We saw her on that day, and she goes a little bit further up the estuary. And then there are other teams that work from the ground and they walk along the edge of the estuary looking for the waders in areas that are not suitable to get into with the boat. So quite a major operation and a very commendable one. And you know, the first of these quack counts was done in January, 1993 
And the latest count considered here is from January 2022. So this data set now covers 30 years. And we're really starting to see the value of these quack counts as we go into these multi-decadal time periods where we can track water bird populations over appreciable lengths of time. And so this is an excellent example of the value of these counts. No counts were made in the winter of 2020 and in both the summer and winter of 2021 due to COVID-19. And I hope that most of you will still remember what that is. Um, it's still around amongst us. But boy, I'm certainly glad to have seen the back of that little episode on a national and global basis. So in all, there are 29 summer and 27 winter counts from this 30-year period, which to provide us with long-term view of what's happened to the waterbirds of Neisner estuary. Here's just a, a, a map of the estuary taken from the upcoming book. Um, the waterbird counts are divided into various sections, as most waterbird quack counts of large estuary of large wetlands um, do. And those names in red there are the names of the different sections. You can also see Feast and Island there over here. And here's Leisure Isle. Those are essentially dry land habitats, whereas Feast and Island is much a marina. And then here you've got these permanently inundated areas, the deep water, even at low tide, the blue deeper channels, and then the intertidal areas are these shades of green. So they're exposed at low tide and they're underwater at high tide. Very important habitat for your, for your, for your uh, paleartic migratory waders. Okay, as I mentioned, um, we came down and spent that week there, and we went out and spent the day with the teams doing the quack count, which is very illuminating. I brought um, uh, my small canoe down there, and Debbie and I were hoping to be able to get out on the estuary and do some water bird counting in addition to the quack counts. But in practical terms, we weren't really able to make much of a dent on that. The estuary is just simply far too vast to get around manually on a canoe like this. So we just spent a day or so paddling around, taking photographs and just familiarizing ourselves with the vegetation of the estuary, some of the different areas, and really trying to build up a, a, a reasonable series of photographs of the birds of the estuary and some of the habitats, which I've been able to use in this talk. It was a very magic week for us. It's a fantastic place, as those of you who know it will know. And those of you who've never been down there, you're really denying yourselves. You must make a plan to get down, spend a week or so in Neisner, enjoying all the things it has to offer. Um, in total, looking at all the information that we were, I was able to get historically from the quack counts, et cetera, et cetera, early accounts, 93 species of water birds have been, have been counted in the estuary. But 30 of those were either not recorded on quack counts or were recorded on less than 5% of the quack counts. And so those can be considered rare vagrants to the system and not really part of the aquatic, regular aquatic avifauna. And the community of water birds typically of the estuary therefore comprises some 63 species. Two examples of rare vagrants are Southern Africa's first claimed spotted red shank which was apparently collected by Layard in the mid 1800s, although that specimen can no longer be traced. And the sixth uh, lesser yellow legs for Southern Africa in November 2010. And there are other rarities too that have pop up regularly at Neisner Estuary. But this talk's not really about those, it's about the, 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 the typical waterbird avifauna. Okay, now I can't go through providing the story of each one of those 63 regular species, but those of you who've listened to me talk before will know there's nothing I like more than showing you photo showing you graphs of waterbird numbers over long periods of time. But I know that's not um, something that's necessarily to the taste of everybody, all other birders out there. But if you will um, allow me to just share some with you in this talk, just to provide particularly good examples 
of what's happening with the waterbirds in Neisner Estuary and the lessons that maybe holds for other wetland sites, water, the waterbirds at other wetland sites in South Africa and perhaps even other parts of the world. So that graph at the top there just shows the trends for two species, the curlew sandpiper and the common green shank. And I've chosen those two because they're Paleoarctic waders and therefore of particular global interest. And they show contrasting patterns. Um, the curlew sandpiper, you'll see the numbers there on the left-hand side of the, the brown um, uh, line there. You'll see a, a bird that occurred in the thousands at the start of the quack counts in the early to mid 1990s, and then a pretty gradual decrease over time to whereas now, sometimes numbers are pushed to even get into the low 100s. Um, one might think, gee, is this something that's happening to the Paleoarctic waders in Neisner estuary generally? No, not as such, because you can contrast that with the numbers of the common green shank there, which you can see the species, the species not as common as the curlew sandpiper in the estuary, but it's remained, it's kept its numbers pretty stable over all these years, sort of hovering around the four to 500 number of birds there over this whole 30 year period. So it's the curlew sandpiper in particular that's showing this major decrease. And it, it, it's a particularly significant decrease because the curlew sandpiper was once the most common water bird on Neisner estuary. And this applies also at many other large coastal wetlands in South Africa, where the curlew sandpiper was also uh, the most common water bird at these estuaries. Um, and that's water bird, not just waded, the most common water bird in the summer months. Um, and it's undergone this catastrophic decrease, not just at Neisner estuary, but at all the other major South African coastal wetlands where number, where, where these sort of counts are being made. So this is, seems to reflect some sort of sub-regional decrease in the curlew sandpiper throughout Southern Africa. And it's occurring at wetlands that have been heavily impacted by humans, but more significantly at wetlands that, where they're, that are well protected and which do not seem to have obvious major loss of habitat. Uh, for example, even at places like Langabon Lagoon, a major stronghold of the species in the past, is seeing the same level of decrease as we see here at Nizer Lagoon, which is also a protected area. Um, this suggests that the, the decrease is being caused by factors across the range of the species. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a migrant from, from, from Asia. It breeds up in the tundras of far northern Russia, um, the Taimir Peninsula area, um, and then migrates all the way down to Southern Africa from from, from its breeding grounds. And therefore the population decrease could be driven by negative factors occurring on the breeding grounds or on their stopover and migration points as they travel across the essentially entire length of the globe on migration. And in particular, we know that the Arctic region is being disproportionately impacted by climate change, the global warming that's occurring. And it's possible that perhaps on its breeding grounds is where the factors are occurring that's driving these population decreases. But it could also be occurring on the migratory stopover points, which are perhaps also being negatively impacted by human and, and, and other climate change developments. Um, but whatever it is, it's extremely worrying. And, and the Curlew Sandpiper has recently, I think, been added to the global red data list but perhaps only as near threatened. But certainly when I look at these graphs that I'm, and information that are coming in from all over Southern Africa, where populations are decreasing from thousands down to low hundreds at many of these sites, suggested that we have an, a decrease that if it goes on for another decade, could be leading to, to the extinction of the bird, at least in this region. Although I can't, I don't know to what extent what we're seeing here is representative of the total global population. It's a species that also goes, I think, uh, down into the Australia, into Australia as a non-breeding species. And of course, many of them don't come as far as Southern Africa. 
Um, anyway, I can't, no, no, no point speculating much further um, at this point, just to make that point. Certainly, the, I think the takeaway message is that Neisner Estuary is providing a good witness area, allowing us to see and pinpoint and identify these sorts of problems um, and prompt some action into looking into them. Um, let's switch over and have a look at some of the waterfowl, because here we want to look in particular at the Egyptian goose. This is a species that, in contrast to a bird like the curlew sandpiper, has undergone an absolutely explosive increase at Neisner Estuary over the 30-year period. You'll see the numbers back in 1993, if you go to the far left-hand side of the graph here, you'll see there were really just half a dozen birds counted in the early counts and then rapidly increasing from there. <clears throat> and in fact, the early accounts from the 1943 and from 1979 count by the Western Cape Wader Study Group make no mention of the species being present at all. Whereas now, look at it, it's just exploded in numbers in the estuary. Um, and I just want to contrast that with two, the two other most common waterfowl on the estuary, the Cape Shoveler and the yellow billed Duck. And both of those have shown a significant decrease over the same period. So one waterfowl, the Egyptian goose, a massive increase. The other two have slowly and steadily decreased. And that may be associated, that these factors, trends may be associated with each other. Um, Jane Turpy in particular says, mentioned that she thought that it would be the aggressive nature of the Egyptian goose um, as a particularly bolshy water and assertive water bird that may have driven um, part of the Cape Shoveler and Yellowbill populations out of the estuary by their dominating nature, which seems like a very, a very um, reasonable suggestion. <clears throat> but the really stunning thing to note is that the Egyptian goose has now gone from nowhere, I mean, not present on the estuary at all, to becoming one of the six most abundant water birds on the estuary. It's not just a little increase, you know, of a, of a colonizer. This bird is now one of the major avian players in this estuary. And this is a theme that I want to build on as I build up, as I come towards the end of this talk, is how some of these changes seem to reflect um, fairly profound ecological shifts in systems. They may be symptomatic of profound ecological changes in the broader landscape, and across global scales. And that's also what we were seeing with the curlew sandpiper, um, that the world is changing and not necessarily in a good way. In fact, certainly not in a good way in, in many ways. You know, there's, there's no evidence to suggest that Neisner estuary as such has become a better habitat for Egyptian geese. The Egyptian goose has occurred, it has increased throughout South Africa, um, almost to pest status in some areas. Um, and this is just reflected in what we see in Neisner estuary and is, is, is a symptom of a broader change in ecological conditions and, and the resultant avifauna related to how we are changing the environment. You know, they love crop plants. They benefited from crop lands. They also benefit from the planting of pastures as well because as, as um, herbivorous species, they can graze in all these kind of habitats, it's greatly to their benefit. And they now breed quite regularly on the estuary too. That pair you see there with chicks are from Thiessen Island itself, and very, very tame. And another species showing a very similar pattern is the African sacred ibis. I want you to just look there again, an explosive increase. Um, again, a species unknown from the estuary back in the 1940s, even up to 1979, no evidence of their occurrence. But by 1973, there were already over 100 birds counted, now increasing up to numbers six, seven, eight hundred birds. So again, a fairly explosive increase. Um, and no indication as to changes in the estuary that should particularly benefit a bird like the African sacred ibis. Um, they do feed in the intertidal areas. Here's a photograph of one bird that we took near Thiessen Island when we were out in our canoe, and it was feeding out in the 
the, the tidal flats there. But we also took this photograph from Leisure Isle and showed a huge number of birds that we saw on the weekend that were clustered around the picnic site on Leisure Isle and were just tucking into the scavenging opportunities. That's one poking around in a dustbin, as a bird like this is wont to do, and digging out chicken bones that it could then gulp down. So a bit like the Egyptian goose, it's benefiting probably from changes in the uh, beneficial changes, scavenging opportunities in the case of the ibis um, in the broader landscape rather than the wetland ecosystem as such. But again, it's become one of the most common birds on the estuary. Um, Okay, like I, you know, we can't go through, as I said, all of these species one by one. But what I did do is I've, the, the, these water bird graphs can tend to show quite a bit of variability depending on local conditions. And um, so what I've done is I've just taken the trend lines and left those on a graph that you see here um, and taken out all the wavy detail, the um, confusing detail of the original graphs. But these trends lines are based on the actual data themselves. And they show the, the population trends over the 30 year period for the major water bird groupings, grouped into ecological or dietary guilds there. And you see this, the, the, the group changing the most dramatically are your invertebrate feeding migratory waders, particularly the curlew sandpiper dominating in that group there. And you see how the trend there going from, you know, over between four and five. 4,000 and 4,500 individual migratory waders down to less than 1,500 in total. Um, but by contrast, the fish eating birds, the purple line, a slight increase. The resident waders and wading birds, like resident waders, would be things like blacksmith lapwing. Uh, and uh, resident wading birds would be things like that um, uh, African sacred ibis. Also invertebrate feeders like the migratory waders, and they're actually increasing, which kind of would suggest to you that the migratory waders are decreasing, nothing to do with their food supply at Nisner Estuary, because the invertebrate feeding resident waders are doing fine out of it. And in actual fact, they're increasing, perhaps moving into exploiting a niche that's being um, uh, left behind by retreating numbers of migratory waders being impacted by perhaps negative factors on a more global scale. And then also your ducks, your herbivores are also increasing. But as I mentioned earlier, that's largely driven by the increase in the Egyptian goose. And in fact, two of the herbivorous ducks, the two other most common species, the Cape Shovel and the yellow bull duck, are actually decreasing but it's the overwhelming and dramatic increase in Egyptian goose that results in the ducks as a, gr as a group showing an increase. And then the other group showing a, a slight decrease there are the gulls. Now, Neisner estuary only really has one species of gull, and that's this bird here, the kelp gull. That's one scavenging there. They're the most generalist feeders of all of the birds on on the estuary and, and throughout on estuaries generally in South Africa. This one is scavenging a dead fish near Leisure Isle. Um, it's actually the second most abundant water bird on the estuary, so it occurs in very good numbers, despite showing a slight decrease. But one thing that, I, that really struck me when I went to um, Neisner Estuary is the essential absence of a small gull species um, from the estuary. The counts we do in Durban Bay, we have large numbers of kelp gulls in the winter when they come up from their southern Cape and western Cape breeding areas, and they come up the east coast, and they're very common in Durban Bay, hundreds of birds in the winter months, and then they move away as when we go into summer, and the grey-headed gull in Durban Bay is exactly the opposite. It's uh, largely absent in the winter months, but floods into Durban Bay in even larger numbers, up to six, seven, eight hundred birds um, during the summer months um, in Durban Bay. So we're quite used to having a large gull and a small gull in Durban Bay as common 
uh, members of the aquatic avifauna, even if in different proportions in different times of the year. But Neisner estuary doesn't have a small gull at any time of the year. The half lives gull, the lever to knot, has apparently never been recorded in Neisner estuary at all, despite being relatively close by in terms of its restricted distribution. Um, so what I've shown you there is just old uh, Sabab, Sabab 1 um, distribution maps of Hartlab's Gull on the left-hand side there. And that's the position of where Neisner estuary is. And it essentially lies just slightly too far to the east of the range of Hartlab's Gull to, for Hartlab's Gull to occur in the estuary. And uh, the gray-headed gull, which is a lot more widespread in South Africa, is also just a rare vagrant to Neisner estuary. We didn't see any when we were there. And I think they're just the occasional individuals or very low numbers in single digits that occasionally occur on the estuary. And I don't know the reason for that, but I, I think it's a really uh, in, interesting research question as to why this fantastic massive estuary with its burgeoning water bird populations of so many different feeding gills just seems to have no niche for a small gull species. Maybe the kelp gulls are just too big for them, but kelp gulls and gray-headed gulls seem to coexist in Durban Bay and other parts of South Africa. Why not at Neisner Estuary? I'll leave that for somebody who wants to try and come up with some hypotheses and test them um, for Neisner Estuary. Okay, now to just come back to my story about how we're seeing fairly deep-seated ecological changes um, in, in a wetland system like Neisner Estuary. Um, this is the, the data for all water birds um, combined for summer and winter cuts. And you see what's happened over time is that typically in the early years, you saw a lot more birds in summer than were counted in the winter cuts. But over time, this has narrowed as some of the resident species, which are present in winter, have tended to increase in numbers, whereas your, your migratory species, restricted to being there only in summer, have tended to decrease, birds like curly sandpiper. And as this process goes on, you come into the modern era where actually for the first time there, the quack count was higher in the winter than it was in the summer. Now that's a fairly major ecological change and one that's a bit disquieting if you think of the extent. These are, you know, you have small changes in water bird populations, individual species, but when it translates to a flipping on its head like this or the whole community, that, that's a cause for, for some disquiet. And if I can just move on to two last species to wrap up the talk. Um, Looking at the Cape Cormorant, a particularly interesting species at Neisner Estuary, as I'll, as I'll go into detail a bit more with the next couple of slides. And this species in the early years here, you'll see was essentially just a winter visitor to Neisner Estuary for the, essentially the, almost the first 10 years of the quack counts, with virtually no birds recorded in summer at all, tiny little numbers. And then gradually over time, again, we're seeing a change with more and more birds, Cape Cormorants being present in the estuary in the summer months. And also, in this case, an increase in winter numbers too. Now we know that the Cape Cormorant is a species that because of the collapse of fish stocks off the west coast of South Africa, have shifted their population, like the African penguin has done, and the Cape Gannet, round to the southern coast, the southern Cape coast of South Africa to try and track the fish populations, a, a factor that nobody really understands the exact reasons for, but it could be related to climate change. And this graph reflects that as we see a, both an increase as more birds have moved into the area with a shift to the south coast and also being present at, um, at both times of the year, in particular increasing their summer presence compared to their winter presence. Again, a fairly major population change in the species. And the Cape Cormorant is also a globally threatened species. It's listed as endangered. Um, 
So it's recorded on 96% of the quack counts of an average of, I think, 230 birds there um, per count. And, and the, the highest number recorded is well over a thousand birds, the maximum. And as such, as a globally threatened species, this would qualify Neisner estuary for both important bird area IBA and Ramsar status, um, purely on the basis of the status of this species at Neisner estuary. In addition, it breeds at the heads area, which I'd like to extend and say that this is also part of the broader estuary. Um, it was first recorded breeding on the Coney Glen offshore stack. That's a photograph of it there. You can see it's arrowed. It's from the viewpoint and the northern edge of the heads there, as you look down out to sea with the main estuary behind you. First recorded there in 1970, breeding in 1973. Number was unrecorded. The first nesting on the western head, on the other side of the head to the right of this photograph, was in 2008 with 282 pairs. And the highest number of 435 pairs in, 20, in 2012. So these are fairly significant breeding instances by this species, e emphasizing even more so um, its, its value as a, as a potential important bird area and as a Ramsar wetland of international importance. And when we were there in January 2022, we counted 105 pairs on that Coney Glen offshore stack. And that was a photograph that, that, that Debbie and I took while we were on the shore, we went down as close as we could get, and there were the birds nesting up on the stack. Obviously, from all that whitewash, you can see they've been nesting there for many, many years, and there's a close-up of various birds on their nests. Particularly, I have a soft spot for this bird because they visit Durban Bay in low numbers every winter. We did a count um, at the end of last week and got the first two birds that have just arrived for the winter season. We only get them in winter here. They come up with the sardines. But we're getting up to 30, 40 birds at the peak of midwinter. It's a very special bird for us in Durban Bay. Durban Bay is probably is by far the easiest, best place to find the bird off the along the KZN coast. Um, so it was nice to see them in their real heartland here on the Coney, Coney Glen offshore stack. And then if I can finish off with, I think it has to be the most emblematic bird of Neisner estuary, the African oyster catcher were a bird that was once a red data species, but whose fortunes have improved greatly in South Africa in recent decades. Um, and this is reflected generally, and this is reflected in the situation at Neisner Estuary. You can see the numbers there in the blue line showing a gradual increase over time. And also the lower line there, the brown line, showing an increase in the number of breeding pairs as well in the estuary associated with our counts. So the average number of birds per count is 65, um, and the maximum of 148 birds has been recorded in a particular count. The numbers on the graph there on the right-hand side are not the same as that because I've summed the, the, summer, the total of summer and winter counts for each year, as opposed to there are two counts every year. So you kind of ends up with a double number. Um, and that also exceeds the important bird area and Ramsar threshold of uh, more than 1% of the global population of a water bird. The global population is estimated at five to 6,000 birds and 65 birds as an average is higher than that. So it would also, this species would also qualify the site for, um, and so would a couple of other species have numbers that are, uh, would, would qualify the site for, for important bird area and Ramsar status. And you get up to 29 breeding pairs of African oyster catchers at Nyasna Estuary. And uh, it's one of the real favorite birds of all the birders in that area and the true emblematic bird of the estuary. So if I can just leave you with this photograph of this bird um, as a symbol of Nyasna Estuary, a place that will always remain very special to me, having spent many, many hours working through spreadsheets of water bird numbers and putting the chapter together and then also spending a very magic week down in Neisner, where I also got to meet Ian and Lorna and Pat, and actually spent time with them and with the waterbirds on the estuary. So thank you all very, very much for listening to the talk as well. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, David. That was that was fascinating, and I, I certainly look forward to to seeing the book when it's uh, when it comes out. Yeah, coming out within the next month or so, apparently. Oh, great! That's very good to hear. Um, yeah, so thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, we do have a few questions, uh, so I'll I'll start to go through those. So um, I'll stop sharing now and come back. Yeah, yeah. that's that's great. Um, but right. before we get to the questions, I just want to quickly remind everyone that we will be back in two weeks' time with another conservation conversations webinar, and the next one will be about uh, the. Hot Birds project uh, with Nicholas Pattinson. I think he's going to be talking about, about Hornbill, which should be very interesting as well. So let's move on to some questions for David. Uh, firstly, from uh, Annalie asking about Egyptian geese. And uh, do you know if there are any projects that are monitoring Egyptian geese? Um, I don't know whether she's talking about Nisna or just more generally. Um, but looking at different environments and neighborhoods and seeing kind of what the trends are and whether their numbers need to be curbed or not. Do you know of anything? I'm, I'm not too sure. Sorry, just getting the screen back. Um, I, I would imagine that there are, you know, again, I would come back to the Coordinated Waterbirds Project, the Quack mm -hmm. data set. You know, there you you're going to find that you know Egyptian goose would just be one of all the waterbird species being counted at that site as part of that project. So I always say that, you know there are hundreds of sites, wetland sites throughout South Africa where Egyptian geese numbers are being monitored. Um, I don't think they're part of the quack of the road of the car road count system though, but I could be corrected on that. Um, and there may be other local efforts to keep to count the birds, but I, I may not, I wouldn't be, I'm not aware of, of those. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, too up to date on Egyptian geese either. Um, now there's a, a question from Rob Simmons. It's, it's quite long uh, giving his um, experiences from Namibia. And um, so I'll just read it out quickly. So in Namibia, uh, Robin and colleagues found from biannual counts at Volpus Bay and Sandwich Harbour that it was the long distance migrants that were showing big declines and the short distance and resident waders were either stable or increased. Uh, the same was found between Sandwich, which is a pristine wetland, and uh, Volpus Bay, which is a, um, you know, a very human influenced harbour. So it was the distance moved and migration that appeared to be the critical factor. And he, he says that's probably climate change related and, and asks whether you think this might explain your results as well. Yeah, I, I would tend to think that it is a global factors that are driving the decrease in the bird like the curlew sandpiper. Um, Considering that the habitats in that it's in living in in South Africa do not seem to be being negatively impacted to the extent that one would expect to see 90% decreases, um, like we're seeing at Langabarn and, and Nisner Estuary. Um, so one would think it's happening somewhere else across the broad extent of their range. So I would agree with Rob. You know, I, Rob did have those long term data sets. I just, I'm not sure if his data, and perhaps he could chip in, you know, maybe he could put something in the chat. I don't know if he had a significant decrease in Curlew Sandpipe. It kind of rings a bell that his was one of the few sites where that wasn't as evident um, as it was at some of the South African sites. Okay, yeah, maybe Rob, uh, you can uh, give us the answer to that. Um, then, Sticking with the, the curly sandpipers, um, Billy uh, says, firstly, great talk. Um, and then in the overall decline in the curly sandpiper, there seemed to be a major decline in the graphs between 2004 and 2007, indicating some sort of uh, critical event. Uh, would, is that the case? Do you, can you remember offhand? 
I can't, um, and that would definitely be something worth looking at. Um, I actually this week was exposed to looking at some work where you can apply statistics to these graphs to look for particular tipping points in graphs where a situation that is increasing or decreasing can suddenly flip the other way. And certainly that would be worth applying that sort of statistical analyses to these types of graphs. Um, but it's not something I've done myself. I've just relied on looking at the overall pattern. Um, I, I don't know why something, one particular factor would occur during that particular period, but certainly it would be something that would be worth interrogating. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it really just demonstrates the value of these long-term data sets uh, once again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Irene Rose uh, is from Kenya, and uh, she is very interested in, well, is handling the, the water file counts in Kenya. And uh, maybe uh, she asks whether um, there's a way to let her know about the book coming out, um, what, you know, once it is out, and then also. Um, whether you could perhaps get in touch with her uh, to to give some advice about handling waterfowl counts in Kenya. So maybe if you don't mind just dropping your your email address in the chat box, and then people can can get in contact with you if you're if you're happy to do that. I will do that, Chris. And I'm just doing it right now. So that would be the best way to do it. Yes, to send me an email, and then I, we can take it from there. Yes. Great. I'm just putting that in now. And I see Rob has um, replied in the chat box saying, uh, indeed not in curly sandpipers, but little stints and not, yes. So the curlies, I guess, didn't decline, but the little stints and knots have, have done so. Yeah. And that data would be a little bit older now. So, you know, be, you know, it would be nice to get more recent information to see how the Kurdu sandpipers are doing at those wetlands in from more recent data. But exactly. I, I certainly, you know, I, he's saying that the longer distance migration species, which suggests they go further north in the temperate regions of the northern hemisphere into those areas most heavily affected by climate change, would certainly make sense if it's something that's impacting these birds on their breeding grounds. And let's face it, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, Western ornithologists getting much opportunity to go up into the Russian tundras under current circumstances. Yes, indeed. Um, then we have just one more question. So if anyone else has any, any burning questions, please do put it in the Q&A box uh, now. Otherwise, we will be ending off shortly. Um, so this is from Shashi, um, and I, I must confess, I can't remember your graph, uh, but the question is um, saying the number of all ward birds seem to show a dip in 1997 and 2016. Have you looked into, or have you noticed that, and have you looked into potential reasons or, or threats in those years? And if you would like to share your screen again, you're welcome to. Um, I could try and do that if you like, yes. Yeah. Um, so it was all the, the, all the water birds. Yes. I think I have closed that. So let me have a look. You know, sometimes one mustn't read too much into changes between, say, one count and the next count, because you can get factors according to, you know, how windy it was on that day or at difficulties of access and things like that. So sometimes, you know, um, it's the longer term, broader trends that are mm. more worth going on rather than particular individuals. So this graph here, then. Um, yes, I mean, this huge dip here, for example. Um, that dip there 
was in, in the chat, I remember that what was described to, I think, a major flood that occurred coming down the Neisner River. And that scoured out and laid and caused huge changes to, to uh, intertidal sections and eelgrass areas and, and or just generally caused a perturbation in the system and a greatly reduced number of birds. Um, in that, that was the January 1997 count. So that was just one very anomalous low count that was able to be ascribed to one particular event. Okay. Um, that was the, one of the cases that was that was uh, mentioned there in the, in the comment. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if, if others can see your screen, but it's still, uh, see, it hasn't quite caught up yet to show your PowerPoint, but I think, um, yeah, I don't know if that's my my side or for everyone, but I think your explanation is is quite clear, and we can wait and see if your your presentation goes. But in the meantime, we have another question from Sue, um, asking about the oyster catchers and whether um, it includes birds from Kroonflay, Swartflay, and Brenton, um, because she says that that is where um, she often sees them. On when she's out walking. Did, so were those areas included in, in the counts or? No, there, there is a broader count of breeding African oyster catchers in that whole area, that Neisner estuary, and including some of the adjacent areas as well. But I only extracted the information from the estuary itself for okay. the number of breeding pairs. So that graph is based just on breeding pairs in the actual estuary itself. Okay. Um, and also the counts of water birds. Although there is a project, as I said, the local bird clubs down there, Lakes Bird Club, um, does do regular counts of African oyster catchers across a broader area. Um, and work, with, I think, with the University of Cape Town on that as well. Okay. Um, another quick question from Rob. Um, whether you have any data on African marsh harriers from the area? No, I think it was just a rare vagrant. And uh, only, I think, it, if I remember correctly, it was only recorded in the 1979 count um, and not from the quack counts at all. So, so no, it's a species that, yeah, and there isn't really much suitable habitat for it either. It's very much a, you know, most of Nisen estuary is intertidal. Um, and the area that does have, Freshwater in the most freshwater um, wetland habitat is associated with the sewage works area and is quite a heavily disturbed area. So I think um, that might explain why African marsh harriers don't seem to be a component part of this system. Um, yeah, so they're, they're not counted on the quack counts. Yeah. If they okay. were there, they'd be good. Yeah. Okay. I think um, we. We'll leave it there for now. Um, oh, wait, I don't see uh, there are no more questions that I can see in the, the Q&A, just a couple of comments. Um, but yes, so thank you very, very much, David, for joining us again. We really love having you on the show. And uh, I hope we can, we can have you back uh, another time, maybe next year uh, for um to present another talk if you have one i'm sure the audience would would love that uh so uh, unless you have any last words i think we will end off no just to thank you christine yes i'd be happy to to come back again and just to thank everybody else for every all the, the people that have tuned in for for bearing with me on this talk and thank you again for inviting me and and to you for for hosting me so competently thank you great uh, you're welcome and, and thanks very much again, David, and thanks to all our, our viewers. Thank you for joining us. I know some of you have had to drop off already because of load shedding. Uh, I hope your, your power comes back timelessly. So thanks very much and good night to everyone and, and see some of you in wilderness next week. Good night.